to everyone who is joining us in all the possible places you might be since we are doing this virtually on behalf of my colleagues, um, my, especially my colleague Karen, Maeda Allman and myself at the LA Bay Book Company, which is located on Duwamish land in the city of Seattle in the Northwest corner of the United States. I'm saying that because we have different parts of the world involved even in what we're doing here today and, and certainly as people join these occasions. Um, this program for us is a little different in that it's being recorded. So um, the time of day uh, that we're doing this is, is morning here in Seattle, but it, will be, uh, but it is uh, moving into evening in um, England where um, our special guest and author Carla Power is. Um, and uh, of course, those of you joining us may be at any stage of day or even in a different day um, as these things get um, seen. So we are delighted um, as, as um, we're recording this just before the publication of Carla Power's extraordinary new book. This is an advanced copy. It's not in soft cover, but it'll be um, arriving in our store and elsewhere um, sh very shortly as it's due out on the 7th. Um, her new book, Home Land Security, Deradicalization and the Journey Back from Extremism, um, drawn from years of work, travel, um, research, and, and countless um, interviews and, and studies and um, sort of delving into uh, scholarly material, but also um, very much front lines about individuals who are drawn into extremist groups. Um, and uh, this is all over the world, and it includes the United States. Um, and um, in, in different ways, not just one political way um, or another, it's, it's, it's various ones. And certainly as we see in the United States now, um, certain pulls in those directions. And that will get touched on too, I think, in the conversation today that she's having um, with the, the, the person she will be conversing with, Shannon Foley Martinez, who is um, joining us from the East Coast um, for this. Um, um, Carla's over in, in England, so we've kind of got several time zones already there. And uh, Shannon has been doing her own work. Um, first of all, um, having herself been involved in um, white extremist um, supremacist movement work um, in, uh, um, and then getting away from that and now helping um, others to see their way um, where they are and how to get them out. And she's been doing this work um, through organizations, through um, lots of appearances and programs and, and giving, giving talks. Um, and she has a podcast, which I think Karen will put in the notes to this. Um, and she also has a, a very active website, um, uh, Shan, Shannon, um, I'm reading this, shannonmartinezspeaks.com. Um, Carla Power comes to this, um, not only um, she, she herself, this is new book, um, follows her um, extraordinary earlier book, If the Oceans Were Ink, um, which was a finalist for both the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and um, this book has been much anticipated. And I will say, we were talking about this just before we started this, um, her publisher at, in the US here is One World, which is an imprint of the, within the whole Random House company, but it's been doing inc incredibly vital, brilliant work. I mean, literary work, cultural work, um, and um, Carla Power's book is very much in line with um, books that are of a certain of a necessity and urgency, um, and and um, but well written. And I mean, there is a book to really read. So today uh, uh, you will get to hear uh, Carla. I think we'll do a little bit of a reading for the book because I, I mentioned that too because it is a bo book that has a real voice, um, and that will be borne out in, in um, hearing it read from, and um, and which you in turn hopefully will come to read yourselves. Um, and then she and Carla will um, converse and then I will um, now disappear and reappear at the end. Um, mm -hmm. So without further ado, um, thank you all again for joining us. And now please give a good warm virtual welcome to Carla Power and Shannon Foley Martinez. Thank you both. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> and thank you, Shannon. <laughs> for, thank you for thank having me. <laughs> would you should I start off by just doing a short reading is that let's yeah. why don't I do that yeah. just to let's get, do that let's do that to warm up okay all right I'm just gonna be reading from the first from the introduction um and it's sort of 
explains um, how I came to kind of uh, decide to, to uh, embark on this project. Like many Americans, I spent the winter after Donald Trump's 2016 election to the US presidency with my blood humming, sensing that some new poison was coursing through both the country and my own body. Nights, I'd lie in bed, my hot face cratered into my pillow, my mind turning over the horror reported that day of bans and walls and regulation rollbacks. My chest tight and my breathing shallow, my muscles braced for something, I wasn't sure what. Staring at the ceiling, then checking the clock slog toward morning, I'd feel waves of adrenaline buffet my fury outward to Trump, to his party, to anyone who'd voted for him. Sometimes the anger curdled into hatred. By day, I'd begun thinking about writing this book. Even as American politics grew more polarized and American extremist voices grew louder, I read about paths people had taken into and out of violent extremism in Germany, Norway, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia. My early research focused on young Westerners who joined ISIS. And in some of them, I recognized something of my own post-election mental state. If one definition of radicalization is a narrowing of one's worldview, a whittling away of the will or wherewithal to understand other, other opinions, I was getting a taste of it firsthand. While the stories I was gathering were of foreign wars and jihadist militants, they bore similarities to the febrile atmosphere in the United States. Describing the project to an acquaintance one afternoon, I was met with disbelief. Surely that was a bit much, he responded. Americans weren't ready to read a book comparing themselves to members of ISIS. But as happens so often, an idea once deemed radical is now mainstream. In February, 2021, the Ohio Capital Journal stated purpose, connecting Ohioan, Ohioans to their state government, was asking de-radicalization experts how Trump era extremists compared to ISIS recruits. After the attack on the US Capitol on January 6, 2021, Elizabeth Nauman, who led counterterrorism efforts as an assistant secretary of Homeland Security for three years under Trump, told Time that the president's role for the insurrectionists was akin to that of Osama bin Laden's spiritual leadership of the 9-11 hijackers. She urged, the, she urged the United States to pursue the insurgents, quote, with the same intensity that we did Al Qaeda. After 9-11, government and media all but equated violent extremists with Islamist jihadist groups. The story was told over and over of how terrorism in the United States had dropped out of a clear blue September sky. It would take another day of national trauma, nearly 20 years on, for many Americans to see what statistics showed and what people of color have long known from experience. The most serious terrorist threat is not foreign, dark, and Muslim, but white and American made. Like the babysitter in the horror movie, who realizes the serial killer isn't in the woods, but inside the house. The country has finally begun to, realize, to recognize the proximity of violent extremists. And I think I will stop there. Um, So that was how I, um, that was sort of a, my springboard into this. Um, and yeah. Yeah, I remember there, there's actually a picture that exists of my whole family. I have very few pictures. I have an absurd number of humans. <laughs> we have eight kids and, uh, that the day after the election, I was just like, we need to go out and go hike. Like we need to go out to the woods. Like we were all just so just like full of fear and 
one of uh, one of my kids' friends at the time um, was with us. They they they're you know LGBTQ plus and just like had this dread. And I was just like, all right, let's go out to the woods. Let's go for a hike. Um, and there's a picture of my whole family uh, like on the day after the election uh, in 2016. And like, I mean, I remember that feeling so intensely of like, I can't. And I mean, and most of my fears that I held that day completely panned out, right? <laughs> like I would love to, I would love to just be like, no, it's fine. Like I was really worried, but it, it turned out okay. Like, no, like we're, yeah. And, and, um, but I, I re I remember that, like I connected so much with that, um, in, in that passage that you read of that feeling right after the election. <laughs> kind of waves of adrenaline. I just remember these kind of rolling crests of like anger, you know, that, 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 that roll up. Um, yeah, it's, um, it definitely, um, you know, and, and that, that is so what I'm trying to get away from. I mean, I so, you know, realize that, one of uh, one of the things we absolutely have to do, and I'd be interested in hearing, you know, in your work um, rehabilitating folks, is to is to disaggregate, is to calm down, take a breath, and then question, you know, you know, what is a terrorist? Like, let's let's break that down. And is someone who's born a terrorist always a terrorist? And how do we make and unmake terrorists or violent extremists in the common discourse? And I was really interested in that, those kind of, you know, machine workings of, of how we talk about political violence. And one of the, I think one of the challenges when we have conversations about this of, of anything. And I mean, because right now it's like we have in terms of, you know, domestic terrorists in the US, it's like in, in just like far right wing um, stuff. It's like that there's a whole milieu of that too. Like, it's not, it's not just like a monolith. It's like, you know, there's like conspiracy theorists, there's like QAnon, there's people, you know, now there's like anti-vaxxers, um, anti-maskers and there that there's violence uh, associated with that. There's, you know, like Adam Boffin division and, you know, and then, so there's, so there, it's not like a monolith, but there, but there's a whole lot like this, it's this whole milieu of, of things that, that are there at this point. Um, when, when we talk about that, but the challenge for me is always just like, we're, when we talk about this, like we're talking about this milieu, but that each individual person has a very personal singular story for how they got there right exactly. that usually involves multiple layers of trauma hardship isolation lacking of like meaning or or you know disempowerment in their lives stacking on top of each other so they have a very personal individual story but that those individual stories are played out amongst this like larger cultural story that we all live amongst right so that the there's this intersection of these very personal stories with this mm. larger cultural societal wide picture um and story that's that's being played out um and for me knowing that both of those things are happening is really important and that if we want to help move people out of this, we have to address both parts. We have to address the larger cultural societal story that's being lived out, but then we also have to meet people exactly where they are, as they are, and address their personal stories. And all of that has to happen all at, at the same time. I completely, I completely agree with you. And weirdly, I mean, I, I mean, the book is sort of structured where I start incredibly personal. Like I, you know, the first part is mothers who lost, whose, whose um, sons um, uh, ran off to Syria. Um, and so it was trying to look at a very small way, a very, you know, domestic dramas that kind of 
our, our push factors. But as, as you say, um, it's also systemic. The things that are pushing folks into these violent groups are also, you know, they're invisible to us because we live and breathe them, whether it's, it's loneliness or isolation or a dead end job and wanting something, you know, um, uh, something heroic to do or, or, you know, really convincing yourself that you're helping people by doing this. Um, so it's that, you know, you don't want to let the systems off the hook. And on the other hand, as you say, every, you know, no story, and, and you would know this far better than I, um, in terms of right-wing extremism, every story seems to have its own special tenure and flavor and reasons. Um, although you can sort of see patterns. Um, but, yeah. but I think, I didn't, I think one of the questions when you're thinking about this is if you just focus on the individuals, then you let the systems off the hook and you let the, the governmental things. And certainly, I mean, we see this, you know, in Afghanistan now, if you, if you only, on the other hand, you do want to um, understand the narratives and the humans and the fact that this is an intensely human activity rather than these monsters that we're so often encouraged to, um, to see. I, I find too that in terms of when we're talking about uh, you know, far right wing um, violence in America, that it is very expedient for us as white Americans to externalize white supremacy out on onto them, right? That if something happens, there's tragedy, there's you know, violence, there's, you know, a mass shooting or, or something like that. It's, it's very easy for us to look at that and just be like, oh, look at that white supremacist, look at that bad, that white supremacy out there. And it's scapegoated out onto the most overt and most violent forms. And I think that we do that very often um, so that we don't have to examine our relationship with white supremacy, right? Like that, if we can look at that violence out there that is the most overt and most violent, we can externalize that and excuse ourselves from looking at like our part in how we uphold and perpetuate in our relationship with white supremacy. Um, and to me, like that is a huge, like that is a huge challenge that it's, that this is not something that is separate from us. It's only its most overt and most violent expression. Um, and holding those two things again, like together, like, okay, like there's external and internal relationships with violence and hate and perpetuation of systems of oppression um, that, that we all have to examine, but that work is really hard um, mm -hmm. and, you know, leaves us feeling unmoored and, um, you know, like requires us to create an imagination of new ways that we could potentially um, coexist and uh, together in, in pluralistic and healthy ways. I remember um, one of the earliest trips I took for this was going to Denmark and this was dealing with um, jihadist um, militants um, during the ISIS, you know, a, a few years as they were returning. Uh, to Denmark, and I was talking to somebody who was in charge of the rehabilitation in in Copenhagen, and he he said it it was it was like this revelatory moment. He's like, our job is not to say what is your problem. Our job is to say, well, what is your problem? And there was a there was a real sense even among this you know police officer that he had. We all need to own this. And we really need, it was the first time I saw that violent extremism is actually a map. It's, it's not something out there, although that's how it's presented. Whether it's white supremacy or, or jihadist violence, it is a map to what has, it can be a map to what is going wrong in our own societies. And the trick is to try to read that map 
it's not, you know, to absolve it. It's not to excuse it. Um, it's not to, you know, tell these people they don't need to take responsibility. But at the same time, there are reasons that these very normal people are going into the hands of these groups. I don't know. Does that, does that ring a bell with your work? Absolutely. Absolutely. That, um, you know, and one, one of, one of the tendencies too, and especially surrounding things like QAnon and stuff right now, that people are just like, oh, well, they're just, the people that are involved in this are just like ignorant. They're just stupid. They're just crazy. Like, um, you know, it's as means of being like, of othering that, right. Of just being like, oh, well only, you know, only stupid people like do that or whatever. But like for people like me, like my, my story of radicalizing into violence, like I was in gifted classes. I was a championship athlete. Um, I, as I was radicalizing, I was like president of my student class that, there was no, like, you wouldn't look at me and just be like, oh, okay, that one, that one's going to be a bad one, right? You, like, there's no way to look at me you and blow no me off as just being stupid or whatever. It's just, there was a lot of trauma and layers of adverse childhood experiences within my household, which from the outside looked totally fine, like upward mobile, middle-class, two-parent family, um, mm -hmm. everything from the outside looked really great, but my experience living in that household was not great. Um, you know, and there wasn't like overt abuse of any kind in my household, but the way that I experienced life in my household was very traumatic. Um, and then when I was 14, I, um, ended up being sexually assaulted by two men at a party. Um, and that was kind of like the last straw. And I just had all this like rage and anger that I didn't have any skills or tools to process. And so I just completely shoved all of that trauma down unprocessed. And the main way that that came out in my life was rage and super deep self-loathing. Mm -hmm. And the angriest people on the periphery of the like punk rock scene where I hung out were the, the white power skinheads. And I think the rage within me gravitated to the rage that they displayed. And at the same time, it was a place that I didn't have to be any good to belong because I felt so personally worthless that me just having the skin that I was born with and, and a willingness to use violence to fight and be violent, like that, mm -hmm. that was all that was required. That's like, there are people that talk about like, oh, if there was like a baseball coach that had come along, not for me, because I mm. didn't feel like I belonged in any spaces where I had to be any good, that I needed these flaws and this, like this, all of this, like anger and rage and self-loathing to just be enough. Um, and so my story is, you know, that, that I am not someone that people would look at and just be like, oh, well, that one is going to like radicalize into like hate and violence. Um, but I fly, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a female, like I fly in the face of a whole lot of assumptions about what people are like. And I have found that to be very true with almost everyone with whom I've worked. Most of them mm -hmm. are not coming from places of ignorance. They are usually pretty well educated, um, that it, it's not, it's not something that we can just like blow off because of this othering that, that we do so that we don't have to feel implicated and that that requires something from us potentially. Mm -hmm. No, I, I mean that, I think that's so crucial. Like I, um, you know, just, just looking at, at a lot of the folks, I mean, who, who went say to fight in Syria or stuff. These were, you know, particularly women. These were, you know, super bright, top of their class. And they took a look at the systems say in Europe or, you know, um, the, and, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about European women and they were like, this system is stacked against me and I'm, I'm gonna, gonna try something new. And, I mean, whether it's it's like rage, as as you say, giving you a space or an aspiration just for a kind of level playing field, if you feel that you're discriminated against, um, is is um, to dismiss these people as mad. And I think there are studies um, 
showing that that psychologically violent extremists tend not to be tend to be pretty normal. I mean, I, there there are a couple of new studies I who show that they might they're they they're well represented on the autism spectrum or something. But basically, psychologically, um, uh, terrorists, for for lack of a better word, are are normal people. Um, I remember going to to Indonesia to um, talk to some folks involved in, in rehabilitation there. And um, Huda Nur Ismail, who's like this incredible guy who runs, he ran a, a conference for former jihadis. And, you know, he, he, he had them networking with academics and filmmakers and, and you know, learning how to, how to polish up sort of TED style talks and, so on. He's like, look, the thing is, they are fucking normal. Um, excuse my French. And um, and I think it it one thing that struck me, and it sounds like you're no exception, is the people who are really um, down in the grassroots doing work, either preventative work or rehabilitation work, are almost to a man and woman sure that it there but for the grace of god it would have happened to themselves or indeed in as in your case happened to them that that nobody given the right conditions we would we could all potentially become extremists or you know and and i know there's lots of debate about as to when you become a violent extremist as opposed to yeah. an extremist but but extremism is something that is intensely human and um and given the right conditions, um, every last one of us could go that way. And I, I, I don't use, you know, like, because I, I like, I, I think that there are forms of radicalization and extreme, like some of that's okay, right? Like some of it is not pro-socially bad. It might not be the healthiest choice for like a robust life, where you know we're embracing complexity and navigating through um but you know I, I don't know it's like they're you know people with their food or you know it's like that they're you know it's like if you meet someone who is a vegan usually you know that within the first like five seconds of having a conversation with them if you meet somebody that's involved in crossfit you usually know that <laughs> right within like the first five seconds that you talk to them but like those are not pro socially bad right like those like those are not socially bad things right like those things are like it's okay to be really into your butterfly collection or, you know, or whatever, like that there are forms of, of extremism that are often like really amazing, right? Like that brings so much interest as somebody who has a lot of autistic folks in her life, in her family. Um, some of that, it just makes my life so much better. And like, I know so much about roller coasters <laughs> because one of my kids was like in really like single focus on roller coasters for a while or sharks or, <laughs> or all this stuff. So it's the, there's a balance there of like, okay, but what we're talking about is extremism that is, that is dehumanizing to other people that we're talking about extremism that is, um, rooted in violence that is rooted in stripping people of their humanity, um, mm -hmm. that look to other humans as enemies, um, mm -hmm. that we can remove our, our human relationship from that talking about this stuff, it's like, okay, like that's the, that's the problem, right? Like the problem isn't that people have, you know, extreme behaviors or whatever. It's that when those extreme behaviors cross over and it involves stripping other people um, from their humanity uh, and separating and dehumanizing other people. And especially when that links with a willingness to use um, violent words, posts, or physical actions against people like that, like that, that is very much, you know, to me that like that, that's sort of the crux of the matter, because all of us have experiences of othering 
people, right? Like, I mean, it, most of us have driven somewhere at some point and been like, oh, those bad drivers from, w you know, whatever country or whatever <laughs> state or whatever, you know, that it's like when we feel disempowered and out of control, it's a very natural thing to create a group of others to blame for why we feel out of control and disempowered, right? Like that, that is a very normal reaction to stress and a feeling of disempowerment. Like our brains mm -hmm. go there naturally. And most of us, I would say probably very close to all of us have some experience of, of othering other people. Um, and I, I mean, I also think, you know, extremism itself is so fungible. I mean, we seem to see it as like what we think of it as, as an extremist now, but, but, you know, the political um, shift, I mean, Nelson Mandela was called a terrorist. Martin Luther King famously, you know, declared himself an extreme. He's like, if I'm an extremist, so be it, you know? Um, radicalization is the sap of life and political change in many, in many, you know, it, it is, it's, it's, um, I, I, I feel so sad that it's, it's kind of been bastardized um, as, you know, a negative thing, whereas, of course, it's, you know, um, uh, it, it can be a force for real good. I mean, Thomas Paine, what was he, if not a radical, and so yeah. on. Um, so I think, and also just, I mean, when, you know, just thinking about like foreign policy, the people we deem terrorists are often, you know, the statesmen of tomorrow sort of thing. I mean, you know, that, you know, we're, we're now going to pause. I saw a, a headline in the Washington Post this morning that we're thinking about collaborating with the Taliban in our, our, fight against ISIS K. I don't know, you know, whether it'll come to, you know, but they are now our allies, at least in dealing with, with ISIS Khorasan. So um, how quickly, how quickly the tides change. And I think, I think you put your finger on it that at its, what you have to think about at is, is the core of it, which is something that refuses pluralism refuses um, other people's points of view and of course, you know, tips over into violence. Um, um, something powered by hate is, is obviously um, not good. But um, I also just think it's really, it's really important to um, link what we're working with. And I'd be interested to, to hear from you, like how you do it and whether you I know you work with individuals, but trying to tie um, extremism to larger trends in society, you know, and kind of chip away at this idea that, you know, the extremist is all that different um, from other forms of, of um, expression or other trends that we're, we're experiencing. I'd be, I'd be really eager to, to know whether you, you come, come across that in your work. Well, I, um, and, and like, and, and I faced some criticism for this before, but I see so much of this, um, in the lives of, um, myself and people, uh, who I mentor that, um, this is really like a layering of, of traumatic events and like adverse childhood experiences and stuff. And like, I mean, I would love for one of the, out, and there was, a, there was a recent study um, that, that came out um, that uh, it was like 80% of people in this study um, is Pete Simi and um, Kathleen, uh, uh, I can't remember, but Pizza Me, okay. I think was the main author on it. And it's like 80% of the people that in their, like in their research, um, number had a scores, adverse childhood experience scores of four or higher. Right. And so one of the things mm -hmm. from the ACE score studies is that as these layers of trauma, these traumatic experiences mount in the lives of children, 
that it's connected to all kinds of less than optimal outcomes, everything from like physical health to being more likely to be involved in intimate partner violence, whether Mm -hmm. as a perpetrator or as a victim. Um, So you're more likely to like smoke and end up in jail and like all, all of these things and like have, you know, worse health outcomes and stuff. Um, over time, they've expanded from the original 10 questions on the ACE scores uh, survey and have, you know, have supplemental questions um, that, that are utilized for, for some different things as well. But in this study, 80% of the people that they interviewed who had been um, either were or had been involved in uh, violence-based extremism um, had ACE scores of four or higher. Right. So again, like this, it's like just one of these like less than optimal outcomes. Um, and so for me, taking that knowledge of very like individual trauma, but then looking like I feel like amongst other pandemics that we live amidst a trauma pandemic, that there's so much violence. There's so much, like even just in our households, I mean, we still with the system in which we live perpetuate violence again and again and again in people's lives, in our lives. Um, just the things that happen to us, the way discipline is is meted out for in a lot of households and schools and, and other places that we carry all of that. And one of the difficulties is that people do not recognize the experiences that they have as toxically traumatic to them. Mm -hmm. Like very often it requires distance. For me, that sexual assault that I endured when I was 14 years old, it took me a decade to even frame that as rape. That I was just like, well, I just Mm -hmm. lost my virginity to two men at a party when I was 14 years old. That Mm -hmm. I didn't recognize that as trauma. I didn't even recognize it as a sexual assault. So that is like, that is one of the difficulties um, is that we have a very hard time seeing the things that are happening to us as traumatic so that it becomes incredibly difficult to, to address. But I think we all carry multitudinous levels of trauma with us and that that absolutely affects our behavior. Um, and that also it's like, there, you know, that there's very classic PTSD that's diagnosable, but there's all of these other kinds of trauma, complex PTSD and perpetrator induced trauma. And there's all these other forms of trauma that are not diagnosable. So that when you look at people who are engaged in outwardly destructive and self-destructive behaviors, like they're not classified as mentally ill, right. But they're not mentally well either. You know, and for me, it's not, that's not a pass. Like the problem for me is like when white people perpetuate violence and we're just like, oh, well, they're mentally ill or they're not mentally well. Like that's not a pass. What I like for me, I'm just like, well, that needs to be extended to black bodies and, you know, brown bodies. And you know, that, that, that is true whenever violence is utilized, that that person is carrying a whole lot of stuff that has led them up to that particular moment. But I think that that's endemic. See, okay, this is interesting because I would argue, like in a weird way, you're all, you're. It's it's almost like see, I I think there might be a difference, and I'm not sure, but um, between how the white supremacist is portrayed and how um, a Muslim um, Islamist jihadi is portrayed. Because like, you know, you get the lone wolf, you get the, you know, he's not well kind of discourse when they're, when it's a white shooter. Um, And you get, you get it immediately linked um, traditionally to Islam, some sort of ideology, some sort of, so, you know, the, the, the Muslim terrorist is not allowed kind of the banality of evil you know he's yeah. not allowed to have a story that no that has has propelled him to this he has just emerged fully formed and we don't understand whereas i do think in terms of the way we talk until very recently i think it's starting to change the way we talk about um folks who who are um white 
you know, who, who are drawn into kind of American based extremisms, they're given a pass that I don't think um, often people of color and, and um, people claiming an Islamic tradition, um, right or wrong, uh, tend to be. I, I, I mean, do you see that difference as oh, well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Right. And I mean, but that's like part of the perpetuation of all of this, right? Like that is, that is white supremacy right there, like in yeah, action. Exactly. Right. And it's not, the problem isn't that this, that, that grace or compassion or whatever is extended to white folks. It's that it's not also extended to black and brown and indigenous folks that perpetuate violence, right? Like that the dehumanizing on another level again of mm-hmm. of non-white you know actors of violence like that 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 is that's that's the system we live in that is that is the perpetuation right there of white supremacy and our how we excuse and recuse ourselves from the violence that the system we live in perpetuates right exactly, <laughs> like, exactly. and i I mean, it's so funny. Go, it wasn't funny. It was alarming to me how, you know, I started off this journey, you know, talking to um, the mother of a son who I sort of was like, oh my gosh, you know, he's not this terrifying figure. He's kind of like, he was like a, a Peter Pan who never grew up and just kind of stumbled his way to, to Syria and to the point where he actually like, called his mom from Raqqa in in the Islamic State to ask if she would give him permission to get on his commander's motorbike without a helmet. So, and so I I started off thinking, oh gosh, these are, these are lost boys. You know, that was my template. These are, these are just young people who stumble into this. And then sort of halfway through my reporting, I realized how a kind of latent racism in that assumption myself, because I had completely, I I infantilized these people and I had also defanged them of any real political beliefs, you know, that these are just children who don't know what they're doing, which of course is the oldest Orientalist trope in the book, you know? And so um, again, it gets back to the importance of, really thinking about, you know, I really thinking about individual stories um, and allowing a, a pluralism in, in so far as what we mean when we talk about um, what terrorists want, you know? I mean, that seems to me to, um, you know, that seems to, to me to be a central question that, that needs to be explored. Yes. Yeah. And so one of the things, um, like in my household, um, that, that we, that I emphasize all the time is like sim, sim, simplicity is the enemy, like embrace complexity <laughs> yeah, always exactly. that so much of what is happening for people as they, as they enter into and surround themselves in these echo chambers is that they're they're looking for very dogmatic ways of being, like where it's very prescriptive. This is good. This is bad. Here are the rules for how you live. Um, it and the intersection of that with like with these layers of trauma is that like your brain is trying to keep you alive. Your brain is trying to make much simpler um, the very complex world that we live in to keep you alive right Mm -hmm. and so it becomes very easy it's like a healthy brain can look at a dog and just be like okay that dog is wagging its tail and that dog is not a threat right like a healthy brain does not just say all dogs are dangerous a healthy brain can say well that dog has its fangs bared and that is dangerous (laughs) i need to flee or do something um but that dog is playing with the ball (laughs) like that dog's not a threat but when our brains are all, you know, are, are, have been compromised by unprocessed like traumas and stuff that 
we seek to make it make things much easier. So it's much easier to have a belief system that says all dogs are dangerous. And then you just don't, you just don't go by dogs at all because that's much simpler to have that dogmatic view of the world. And so most of the people, as they are building and enforcing these echo chambers around themselves, that they are really just trying the, to make easier the complexity of life, right? So for me in my household, that this is something that is so important for us to just, to, to hold one another accountable for like, all right, how are we viewing this problem and the things that we face? Are we viewing this complexly? Are you, am I listening to alternative viewpoints on this? Am I willing to change my mind about something when presented with like better information or with a point of view that I hadn't hitherto thought of? Um, and my oldest son now is about to be 24 and he like, he just sent me a thing that he had posted <laughs> in a comment section on somewhere. And like, and it was basically like this, like, no, like we have to do the work of embracing complexity all of the time. And he was talking about organizing in like leftist spaces and stuff. Um, huh. but it was like, that it's like, we have to embrace complexity that we cannot winnow things down, even though it is feels so much better to winnow things down so that we can hold on to them so that we have a framework for understanding the world that it doesn't require so much work from us. Um, but that to me, like that is the most important thing because like even what you were talking about, like, yeah, there are, there are some people who embrace this stuff who are just children who are, you know, but then there's also, but then that's that also completely also not true, right? Yeah. <laughs> not that, that exactly. both things are true at the same time. Exactly. Absolutely. And yeah, it, it, it's almost as though the, the main message has to be, we've got to be able to hold opposite ideas in our brain at the same time and learn to live with it. And, and that seems to me to be important when you talk about terrorism, when you talk about democracy, and when you, you, um, when you talk about, you know, a, a domestic you know, should we, should we get pizza or hamburgers tonight for dinner kind of thing? I mean, no, I, I don't mean, and I do mean to, ch that sounded glib and I don't mean to make it glib, but I do think, I think you put your finger on the pulse that it's this simplification, which of course populists use um, and, and, and some, some politicians use to rally people. I mean, I, I am so constantly struck that you know George Bush came came on you know after 9-11 nine days after 9-11 we're all traumatized we're all terrified and you know his his message is you're either with us or you're with the terrorists and where did that leave you know millions and millions of people who really weren't so sure about foreign policy or really had some problems with ways that we were throwing our weight around in the world or all sorts of other things. And to split the world in two in that very simple way is tremendously bracing and exciting. And it's no surprise to me that like, you know, 15 years later, 14 or 15 years later, ISIS was praising Bush for having, having said, you're either with us or you're against us. Um, so these divisions of the world, I think, um, are, are what we have to be more suspicious of than necessarily any pat particular um, group. It's, it's a way of thinking that we have to remind ourselves of um, to get back into um, real dialogue or real, un attempts at understanding and you know I, it's it's difficult right like, I mean like I it I have to in order to be able to mentor people as they leave this stuff like I have to see them as fully human right like I have to I have to look at them and just be like okay these people are engaged in terrible awful things and are spewing out harm mm -hmm but that they are right. still human and they are worth my time and investment and that, and the connection that I have. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it requires compassion on my part, mm -hmm. but 
Um, again, like even just having that conversation is really difficult because there are a vast number of people who hold a very legitimate point of view that like, well, what about their victims and targets? Like, where's your, com and of course, right. like I have the uh, utmost compassion and do work in a lot of different spaces as, you mm -hmm. know, as, as part of, of what I do or whatever, and part of just my life. Um, but like, that's a really legitimate viewpoint too, that it's like, here we are talking about these people as people and compassion and all of this stuff. But it's like, we also, you know, like that there is at the same time, a very legitimate criticism of like, yeah, but they're engaged in really bad stuff, right? <laughs> like that maybe, maybe they're not, you know, maybe they're not worth, um, you know, and so for me, it's, it's this question of like, okay, well, whose responsibility is it to do the work necessary to help move people and shift people out of that? Right. And so for me, it's like, that's never the responsibility of their victims and targets, right? Like that, and their, their oh, yeah, victims exactly. and targets may choose that path for themselves as a holistic path for themselves, but is super not their responsibility. Right. So I see it as, you know, like, all right this is my responsibility to, to do that. Like as, as you know, white people in America, it's like, this is our job. This, our job mm -hmm. is to make the connection and do the work necessary so that Jews and black folks and people of color, like are no longer targets and victims of extremist violence in this country. Mm -hmm. But that that's that there's that difficulty of even talking about what we're talking about, you know, that, you know, and also, I don't know, I, I, I you know, you're like, that was glib. I'm just like, my sense of humor at this point is just so like dark and jaded that, that I'm just like, if I don't find ways to laugh about this, like I will, I would just be in a corner rocking myself. <laughs> holding my legs like I'm engaged in you know in really bad places a lot of the time and things are honestly getting worse so <laughs> we have to find those ways to laugh through through this or but that's you can't keep you know, going I'm, that I mean I think humor is incredibly important that this is this I mean if if there's any um hope of human connection I mean not laughing you know at, at but but I I completely understand that instinct, and I also I also think that that um, you know that that, that I re I remember um, talking to somebody who um, a former neo Nazi who works with um, with Nazis in um, in Germany, and he was saying we go up to them and we say. Um, Oh, actually, actually, this wasn't a former neo-Nazi. It was, it was just a rehabilitator, somebody else. Um, uh, whoops. We lost Carla. Oh, you, we lost you're Carla. There, you're there still, Shannon, yes, okay. Yes, I'm still here. Okay, good, I was like, Carla just went. Um, we were thinking it was probably about time to put, put things to bed, but maybe Carla put herself to bed um, <laughs> sooner than we thought. Um, we should Hopefully she will log back on here in a minute. Yeah. She might. So what are your Maybe. thoughts as you've been listening to uh, our discussion? Oh, this has been, no, it's been great. I mean, okay, this is one of these technical things. Um, are you back, Carla? I think you're muted again. Yeah, no, I'm so okay. sorry. Someone, okay. phone called something oh, okay um, i was gonna say carla we probably are getting close anyway so but go ahead and keep exactly. on to where you would where where you're going but yes we're probably without audience questions coming in which usually is part of this um go ahead thank thank you both thanks for coming back too oh my gosh, yeah, absolutely i didn't do a runner no no I, I i and actually this is a good place to end um this um gentleman said you know what we do when we deal with he, he was working with neo-nazi youth and he said we tell them we we know that there are nazis and we don't approve of the nazism and we we i don't think he said hate but we know that that is not all there is to you and we want to encourage the other parts of you um so that did I just disappear again? You're back. You're back. I'm heard back. You all the way. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. 
this is very real. Okay. Um, and that's, but yeah, and that's the challenge, right? It's like, if we want to, so to me at this point, um, I take it as a given that every kid in America is going to be exposed to anti-Semitic racist comments and content online. Mm -hmm. That it is, so. that is a certainty that it, their really? lives will intersect with this. Stuff. Yes. A hundred percent. Yes. Um, that, and so uh, we have to, to me, I'm just like, I have to look at my kids and just be like, they are potential terrorists <laughs> and just like they potentially might use drugs. They potentially might become smokers or whatever. Like this is a danger that they face. They might wander out into the street and address that and parent them for the reality that they face instead of living in a little bubble being like, not my kid or whatever. Just every kid in America is absolutely going to collide with these ideas. They're going to collide with these spaces in their life because it's everywhere on the internet, absolutely everywhere. And one of the biggest challenges right now is this intersection with like accelerationism where it's not as ideologically driven as the violence that came before. Like there were just reports like, oh, the far right is praising, you know, ISIS stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, of course, because the, all there that the rejection of modernity, seeing the world as being just this terrible place, that mm -hmm. there's no future for me, that, you know, I, I don't have any stake in the future, so let's tear it all down. Like, that messaging is really potent, and especially for young adults and youth, this idea of, like, well, I can't find meaning in this future that feels unreachable, but I can find mm -hmm. meaning in a place where, like, this despair that I feel has some utilization in this in this in this space and so for me it's just like we have to make the shift and begin having the conversations that we need to have with our children and examine the ways that we are in the world and and have a pathway for healthfully processing the very real trauma that we are still all living amidst, especially here is, you know, Delta variant is like just out of control and all of the things that come from that, that recognizing that and living that way, because it requires people are just like, oh, well, that's just ideology. And, but it's not ideologically driven at all. Like it is all of these very personal reasons for people embracing these ideologies and these, and the ways that they exist in the world. Um, and so mm -hmm. that's our challenge to, for me, it's just like, okay, like how do we do that work, which is very human and requires that connection and, um, you know, and, and accepting people where they are as they are. And at the same time, having those boundaries where it's like, well, I don't want to talk to you about that stuff. Like that's, those words aren't okay. Those, you know, that's not something that I want to hear in my presence or, you know, or whatever. And that having those boundaries and communicating them um, is essential. If you are able, <laughs> if you're, you know, while, while you're engaged in the very personal connection um, and I think it's worth it because it keeps us all safer, right? Like if we don't have terrorists, we're all safer. Um, so to me, like that, that's, that, that, that it's worth doing. Absolutely. I mean, I love how you're thinking of it in a kind of public health, oops, public health space. Um, and, and, yeah, I could go on talking forever, but uh, to you. So I, yeah, I hope I'll get to meet you one of these days in person. And, that would uh, be fabulous. Yeah. I, and I will come in here because because I am the audience in the live part of this as it's been, and this has been such a, a, a live, uh, even even this way. In fact, I didn't say this at the beginning, but for those of you who are who are watching this. Um, this is the first time or the most that Carla and Shannon have actually met. Um, you wouldn't know it because they have such <laughs> a, 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 a something, you know, between them. And, and um, you're also getting the benefit of, of doing this this way. It has a, just, it's like two people sitting down at a table and just going. And, and it's, so it's, it's gone beyond some of the bounds of here we are with microphones and on a stage somewhere with an audience, which would be a wonderful thing. Because the other thing we're not getting here is 
audience other questions for both of you. Um, I think, I mean, directed to Carla's book, but also the things that Shannon's um, really touched on, which includes really drawing a lot of this to um, things here in this country and our ways of seeing and, and, and labeling and, and, you know, the, the part of white, where white supremacy is, how pervasive it is, and, and including in people who are othering um, those things to others. Uh, but both uh, of you, this is just what a way to um, introduce Carla's book, Homeland yes. Security, and um, which um, by the time this is being seen, you um, can start reading, um, and um, it's it's an it's an important book. Carla, is it being published in the UK too? Uh, since since you are there, um, it's I, right now we're rolling it out in the states. You can still okay. get it in okay. the UK. There is a you know there's a lot of this book is about you know people in in, in Europe and other places uh, because you yeah. mentioned uh, who go who went to Syria and other places and. And I, I think it's in, in 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 other languages as well. This book will have a has a real place. I'm not knowing if some things in other languages have been published that cover some of this, but I think you really have done um, really vital work in in bringing this, you know, the draw in, and then how to how to begin coming back out of it, and 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 what and what of it what it, there is of it in 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 each of us. I mean, both of you drawn that out like the you know that I, uh, saying this in the end of summer to Shannon's part about the people driving from other states. We're in Seattle, we're going, who are these drivers? Anyway, that's, uh, <laughs> uh, not, uh, not us. Anyway, thank you both um, very much. And um, Car we hope to get you, see you, Carla again. Thank you for this and hope hopefully travels. I know Carla has family out this way, so um, that would have been part of it too. You might've been able to time it to going up to one of the islands to visit family when you were in Seattle and do come see us. And like I would not. Yeah. I would not miss. I will drop by Elliott Bay. Uh, uh, yeah, no, no doubt about it. Thank you. And Shannon, good luck with all your work and um, keep keep it up. And um, we'll and hopefully see you uh, one way or another again soon. Um, uh, but thank you both for your time. And um, it, it, even though this will be on a is recorded, but it's moving into evening, well into evening now here for Carla. So um, thank you all for joining us and. Um, um, be well and stay safe as we keep navigating that too. Yes. Thank you yeah. so much for having me, Carla. It has been such a pleasure. We'll have to, to stay in touch for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you should, you should be writing a book too. So, uh, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to work on you for that. Yeah. Yeah. So and, uh, we'll, we'll anyway. in the motion. Um, thank you for having, it was really, really fun. And even though we were talking about extremely unfun topics i had a ha, had a lovely time so yes let's let's do this again soon best of luck okay. with your book like thank i you. hope it just i hope it does super well thank you for the labor and effort of immersing yourself in those spaces to write it well i'm in awe of people like you who are doing the really really hard um under the nail dirt kind of work um to to uh, you know, help people out of this. So. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Bye. Thanks.